Hello and welcome to the 15th lecture in the Asian Development Bank 3i video lecture series. I will be talking to you today about impact evaluations in microfinance. So what does an impact evaluation tell us? An impact evaluation of a microfinance program will tell us if for its targeted population the program achieved its desired objectives and if in fact for the targeted population the changes that we observe can be attributed to their participation in the program. This information is useful to practitioners as it tells them if the program had an impact, what components of the program were cost effective and where is the need to innovate to enhance program effectiveness. Microfinance, as we all know, is extremely unique. The group-based lending model of microfinance is possibly the only model in development sector which has been replicated with success across context. This success, in fact, led to microfinance being seen as a magic bullet to end economic poverty and in turn led to a proliferation of stakeholders with donors, social investors, technical service providers jumping onto the bandwagon of microfinance. Microfinance captured people's imagination and anecdotal evidence celebrating its success became commonplace. Ironically, however, crisis and success have been two facets of microfinance sector the world over. Microfinance institutions have been accused of causing over-indebtedness, profiteering in the gap of development, leading to client suicides. In the backdrop of these two extreme narratives, therefore, where does the reality lie? Around early and mid-2000s, microfinance caught the attention of researchers who wanted to find what it had changed by how much and for whom. Does microfinance actually reach the poor? Does it encourage entrepreneurship and in therefore alleviate poverty and empower people? The study of Spandana, a microfinance organization in India, is a case in point. It looked at the impact of Spandana's microfinance operations in Hyderabad, the capital city of Andhra Pradesh. Andhra Pradesh, as some of you might know, is also the mecca of microfinance in India. Another important thing to note here is that Spandana is a for-profit MFI. So what were the researchers trying to find? The study focused on the impact of microcredit on the following four outcomes. Changes in household borrowing, changes in household consumption, changes in household businesses, and the empowerment effect of microfinance, if it changed the way the women participated in household decision making. The household, therefore, was the unit of analysis. This brings us to the question of how do we measure these changes and who do we compare? One answer can be that we compare people who have access to microfinance with people who do not have access to microfinance. Such a comparison, however, is not likely to yield accurate results. This is mostly because areas where microfinance institutions operate may be intrinsically different from areas where they do not operate. And similarly, microfinance clients may be intrinsically different from people who do not choose to participate in a microfinance program. We call this the selection bias. Hence, how do we get a treatment group and a control group which are comparable to each other? Randomization is the answer. So how was the randomization done for this study? Spandana was asked to identify communities which in its assessment were a fertile ground for launching microfinance operations. Spandana identified 104 such communities. On these 104 communities, the researchers did a matched pair randomization, whereas communities with similar levels of average per capita consumption and per household debt were grouped into pairs. One of each pair was randomly assigned to treatment and control group. The community then became the unit of assignment. For the communities that got assigned to treatment, all women in the age group of 18 to 59 who had resided in the area for at least one year had a valid identification and residence proof and were willing to come together in a group became eligible for a loan from Spandana. This was a loan of rupees 10,000 at 12% non-declining interest, amortized over 50 weeks. This then became the unit of treatment. So what did microfinance actually change for an average borrower? The study looked at the average impacts on 6,850 households over a period of 3 to 3.5 years. And what did the study find? The study found no change in, in the average consumption of, of the borrower. However, there was an increase in the purchase of durables. On the loans also, there was low take up of loans and people continued to prefer other sources to borrow from. For In terms of businesses, people who borrowed from microfinance institution were no more likely to be entrepreneurs and for people who, for whom the profits increased were people who had existing businesses and larger businesses. On women's empowerment, the study found no impact. 
So what went wrong with microfinance in this particular case? It's possibly the theory of change. So what Spandana envisioned was that if it provided a dose of credit, that money would be used by borrowers to either expand the existing business or start a new business, which in turn would lead to increased income. The assumptions being that credit is possibly the only constraint people have, clients who would borrow from Spandana would be naturally entrepreneurs and money is not fungible, and the profits that would ensue from the business would be greater than the interest they would be paying on the loan. So this is what Spandana envisioned would happen. However, what actually happened was that the dose of credit was used to purchase durables and there was in fact no change in income. So was the promise of microfinance oversold? Evidence from systematic reviews echoes the evidence found in the Spandana study. One of the reviews says that there is in fact no well-known study that robustly shows any strong impacts of microfinance. On the contrary, microfinance is a cause of concern, it has made flawed claims and made people poorer. It has had no impact on women's empowerment and impacts, if any, have at best, at best been mixed. So what are some of the lessons that we can draw from the Spandana study? The foremost lesson is that it is important to communicate findings. The researchers on this study communicated the findings and put these out in the public domain for discussion and debate. However, it did also lead to a lot of bad press which meant that messaging, if any, needs to be more controlled and the researchers acknowledged this need and later on came out in defense of the microfinance sector saying that microcredit as a product had achieved exactly what is expected of a financial product. It allowed people to make larger purchases. Secondly, it also highlighted the need of engaging with stakeholders and engaging with them on an ongoing basis to make sure that there was buy-in on the study design and the findings and more so when the findings were negative and not in favor of the program. This is however not to say that practitioners took no cognizance of the study findings. The, the study findings contributed to the churning within the sector about innovation and it led to microfinance institutions integrating new components into their program which included product diversification, financial literacy training and livelihood support. It also reiterated the need to refocus on social poverty and integrate performance management to reach the double bottom line. In conclusion, as we have seen in this video, impact evaluations can contribute evidence on the true impact of a program. However, this evidence is of no use unless researchers and practitioners come together to make use of this evidence to design better programs. Thanks so much for watching this video.